everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come and eat. Listen diligently to me. Uh, John chapter 15. Um, I love this passage. I'm going to read it all the way through. While you're turning there, I'm going to go ahead and start reading. And these are some of the last words of Yeshua before he uh, was apprehended by the evil one and taken into custody. And a ser series of events happened which um, led to his death. Uh, John chapter 14, 15, 16 and 17 are some of the most intimate words of Yeshua to his disciples and some of the most important words that he could have given them before they were about to endure probably the most agonizing moment of their life. And these are words which we can live by and he gave them to us because we too are his disciples. In John chapter 15, verse 1, he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. By way of a little bit of background, in the temple at that time in Jerusalem, a lot of wealth poured into that temple from all around the nations because the Jews were scattered throughout the region and the empire. And over, um, I don't know if it was, in, I think it was the Nicanor Gate, but one of the gates that went into the um, temple, uh, Edersheim talks about it, Alfred Edersheim. But there was a, a, a very fancy gate, very, very elaborate. And on this gate, I haven't read this in a while, but on this gate, there was a, um, there was gold filigree uh, made up, it was like a grapevine, made out of gold. And people could buy, wealthy people who made donations to the temple could, could buy, uh, if I remember right, like a grape that would then be attached up on this gate and, and different, and then it would make clusters. And that was like a, a way to contribute to the wealth of the temple. It was a kind of charitable giving, but then it, 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 that was your grape and, and that was your, um, uh, your plaque, if you will. And uh, anyway, so when Yeshua said, you know, people would look at this, this and they would say, wow, you know, so-and-so gave and, and, you know, look at me and this and that. And he says, no, no, that's not where your focus should be. Your focus should be on me. I am the vine. You are you know, the branches. So I, I, with that backdrop, um, this was at the temple, the temple of the, uh, the entrance of the temple. And Yeshua was that temple, um, in a sense, and, and his body uh, was that temple. And he remember he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And he was talking about his body. So that's a little bit of background. He says, I am the vine, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, and that it may bear more fruit. I, I prune trees and trim trees for a living. I've been pruning fruit trees and all manner of other edible and non-edible plants and trees um, almost my entire life. I'm an expert at it. And I've pruned grapes, and I have grapes, which I prune. So I understand what that means. It is very real to me. He says in verse 4, Abide, oh wait, verse 3, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, 
And I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If they abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples." As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. You see a reoccurring theme here. In fact, a reoccurring word. It's the word abide. And I want to talk a little bit about this from a Hebraic perspective as well as from an arboricultural perspective. Arboriculture being the fancy word that refers to the care of, of trees. The concept of abide is, is, a, is a Hebraic concept and I want to show some scriptures or share with you some scriptures where the concept of abiding uh, is mentioned and def define the words for you. We see in Psalm 15 verse 1, Yehovah, it says, Yehovah, who shall abide in your holy tabernacle or in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell in your kadosh or holy hill? David is asking the question, or the writer of this psalm, uh, it probably was David. The word abide there is the Hebrew word gur, G-O-O-R, and it literally means to sojourn, dwell for a time, stay for a while, to assemble oneself, to seek hospitality with. So he's asking who will abide, who will dwell with, who will seek hospitality, who will stay a while with me in my tabernacle or my holy hill. This, this is not a difficult concept to ask or to, to uh, ponder. This is something that the Father is asking of His people. Will you tarry with me? Will you hang out with me? You know, I made you in my own image. Um, you, this tabernacle was made so that I could dwell with you and dwell and abide with my people. So will you dwell and abide with me? In Psalm 61, verse 4, the question is asked, I will, um, I will abide, and that's the word gur again, in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the cover of your wings. Actually, it's not a question, it's a statement. So there in the tabernacle, under the wings, and it's talking about the wings of the cherubim that were over the Ark of the Covenant. So there is that place of covering, that place of intimacy, that place under the glory cloud, in basically at picturing being in the presence of Yovah at the foot of his throne. And again, that's a very safe, secure, loving, protective place to be. And that's what we should all be striving for. That place of abiding, not just on Shabbat, not just on those special moments or times when we get together, but to living, be living our lives, abiding, sojourning, hanging out with him. In Psalm 61, 7 it says, He shall abide before Elohim forever, or prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. Now this is a different word, though it's the same word in English, it's the word yashab, Y-A-S-H-A-B, and in Hebrew and it means to sit down, to set, to remain, or to stay. So it's not just, abiding is not something you just kind of give Yehovah your two minutes token worth or ten minutes a day and you're, you're heading off to go do your thing for the rest of the day. It's actually spending time, building relationship. That's what abiding means. I think you all can, you know, you all have a sense of the word in English. Well, that's what, a word, what it means in Hebrew as well. Psalm 91, one, uh, a psalm that many of you know by heart. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide 
or under the shadow of the Almighty. The word abide there is a different Greek word or Hebrew word altogether. It's the word lun, L-U-W-N. It means to temporarily, temporarily lodge, to pass the night, or to stop over. So there it has a more transitory meaning, but still you're spending time with him, like overnight. If we go up to John 14, or 15, the passage we just read, the word abide there, and we just read that, is the word in Greek, meno. Um, and it means, um, it's actually mena, it's, it's, it's uh, spelled um, mu, epsilon, nu, and omicron. And it, it literally means to um, remain, to dwell, to continue, to tarry, to endure, um, sojourn, to not, not to depart, uh, to, to um, you know, it has that kind of a, you know, basically to stay or to wait, hang out. So it has a similar meaning as, as, the, as, the, as the Hebrew words. And that's the, that's the word, well, I don't know the word that Yeshua used uh, when he was probably speaking in Hebrew, but that's the word that's been translated from the Hebrew into the Greek when the book of John was written. I believe it was probably written originally in Hebrew or Aramaic. But we have what we have, and that's the Greek word. So this is the concept of abide. Now, since we were introduced to the concept of trees, there in uh, where Yeshua said, I am the vine, you are the branches, let's look at several examples in the Bible of Yeshua or uh, of the biblical writers likening human beings to trees. And trees are a metaphor, or can be a metaphor in the Bible, for human beings. Um, one of the first references I think of is Psalm, the first Psalm, Psalm 1, where it says, verse 2 and 3, it says, uh, actually through 4, but his delight, that is the delight of a righteous man, is in the Torah, the laws, the commandments, the instructions and righteousness of Jehovah Elohim. And in his Torah doth he meditate day and night. So there he is, he's spending time. You know, when you meditate, you're actually spending time to quiet your mind down, quiet your life down, so you can open up the Bible and ruminate and digest and read and study what's being said there and pray it and, and say it and maybe memorize it and then let the Holy Spirit uh, convict you and, and maybe instruct you and help you to apply those things to your life. But his delight is in the law, the Torah of Jehovah, and his the law doth he delight day and night. And he shall be like a tree. So it's a, a, a simile here. He shall be, the righteous man shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so. They are not like this tree that is planted by the river, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Why would a tree want to be planted by the river? So it can get the water. If you notice, you go out in the desert, like in central Oregon or some of the arid regions, you will see that the area all around it, you go over to eastern or central Oregon, and it may be just sagebrush and rock, rim rock, and juniper trees, or pine trees. But then you go where there's a river, and there's all these willows, Mostly willows growing along, at least in that area, and sometimes cottonwoods and things like that, growing along the river. Just down where I live, the Willamette River is right at the end of the street, and there's all these cottonwoods. Big co some of them are four, five, six feet in diameter, and some of them are 100 to 130 feet tall. They're growing right along the river. So anything in the cottonwood or the willow or the popular, poplar family, the salix and the populous families, they like lots of water. And they grow where, they can, where their roots can suck up lots of water. And because they get water, they are, their leaf isn't going to dry out. It's not going to desiccate in, during the hot summer. Because a tree sucks up a lot of water and it, 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 it 
lets a lot of water off. It cools the surrounding environment. We'll talk about that in a minute. And, and as water is, is pulled up through um, atmospheric pressure and other factors, mechanical factors in the tree, it pulls up water. And with the water is pulled up food and juices and starches and sugars and carbohydrates and things like that, just like in our body. And then the sugars stay in the plant to feed the plant. And then the water just keeps transpiring out. And you can actually sit under a tree on a hot day. Some of these trees that use a lot of water, like birches and poplars, poplars and willows, you can actually feel a, little, a misting, misting coming down on you. And some people maybe don't feel it, but they'll see if they park their car underneath it, they see little bits of sap on their car, and that's what's happening. So Psalm 1 uh, talks about men being like trees planted by the water. So Isaiah 44 verse 3 says that, um, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, this is Jehovah speaking, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessings upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. You know, you go down into Israel, and uh, you go down from, let's say, Jerusalem into the Jordan Valley, and you pass through the really arid regions of the, of the Jord, uh, Jo um, Jordanian or the uh, Judean foothills. If you stand on the Mount of Olives and you look to the north and to the east, it's just barren hills as far as you can see. And then if you drop down from Jerusalem, it's about 30 miles or so down to the Jordan Valley. And it, again, it's, there's like almost no grass. And what, it, what there is, the nomads eat it down to nothing. I was there in the spring and there was a little bit, but the nomads, the, the Bedouins, I should, well, they're nomads, they, 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 they don't know about overgrazing, you know, and they just graze what they can. They're, they, they don't, well, I don't want to get into it, they don't care for the land like the Jewish people do. It's a whole different mindset, but it's just barren. And then in the summertime, it dries up. And then there's little valleys, little wadis, here and there, and if there's a little spring where it feeds them, um, then there will be trees growing in these dry little valleys that would otherwise be dry. But then you get down to the Jordan River, and again, it's dry. The Jordan Valley, um, especially down by the Dead Sea. But if you head up the Jordan Valley north, up toward the Galilee, there's, it's, there's, there's farming and agriculture takes place. But right along the valley, the Jordan River, there's all these willows that grow. So, um, again, there's looking for the water, because it's, otherwise it's a very dry region. So they grow right along the river bank, and, and in a little bit, but not too far. Jeremiah 17, verse 7 says, Blessed is the man that trusts in Jehovah, and whose hope Jehovah is, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, for her leaf shall be green, and shall be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So this is almost a restatement of what we read in Psalm chapter 1. So, let's go now and take a little closer look at John 15 verse 1, and uh, verses 1 through uh, 10, and where we see the word abide and Yeshua is speaking about, I am the vine and you are the branches. So, here we see Yeshua relating the concept of abiding, abiding in him to being like a plant or a tree that has branches. What are the spiritual implications of abiding in Yeshua? And how do we abide in him? Um, we're gonna, we'll talk about the spiritual aspects of this, and then we're going to get into a little bit of tree physiology. And, um, and I'm going to put on my arborist hat at that point in time, and we're going to talk a little bit about how trees, how trees benefit from the water and, and, and their surrounding environment, and how that is such an uh, excellent picture of our lives and what we are called to do in our relationship with Yeshua the Messiah. Now, interestingly enough, the term abide 
is found nine times in this passage from John 15 verse 1 through chapter through verse 10. But a nine isn't a it, not a real notable biblical number. I mean, it, it has significance, but that's not what I want to focus on. But let me just say this. Of those nine times, seven of these times are in reference specifically to abiding in Yeshua or the Father. Seven of the nine times, there's a two other places it's, it's referenced and it's referencing something else. But seven of the nine times reference this, abiding in Yeshua and the Father. Now we all know, we're being good Bible students, we all know what the number seven means. It's one of the most notable numbers in the Bible. It has great um, spiritual significance. And of course it means completion or fullness or perfection. So I think what the Gospel writer was teaching us here, whether he was cognizant of it or whether it was just fortuitous, or I hate to use that term, but it was just, he was led of the Spirit, either way, I think it was still spiritual, led of the Ruach, to mention this nine to, or seven times, and each one is a different aspect, when you study it out, of what it means to abide in Yeshua. So, what we take, what I take from this, is that when we abide in Yeshua, we will have perfect, we will be perfect, or we will be made perfect and complete in our lives, all areas of our lives both spiritually and physically and emotionally and mentally all areas of our lives both our spirit man our soul man our mind will and emotions and also physically we will experience healing because he is a river of life he is a river of life and inside of a tree literally there is flowing a river a river this especially in the springtime I wish I could demonstrate this for you right here. I'd have to take you out on the, one of my job sites. But this time of the year, I, I just uh, last week I pruned out a birch, a large birch tree. And then this, this week I took down a very large birch tree that was about this big around and it had about nine trunks or I don't know, a bunch of trunks coming up about 50 or 50, 50, 55 feet high, probably 50 feet tall. And literally, it, it was, I was cutting some big cuts, and water was dripping out, just drip, drip, drip continually out of both of the, the one, I, one last week I pruned, the one this week I took down, and literally the water was pouring out, and even after I cut off those branches, water was still pouring out of the branches. There's so much water being sucked up, especially in the spring of the year, because the buds have to swell and then eventually it will put out leaves and it takes water to do all that. Literally underneath that tree, as I was taking it down, when I, when I, I was able to stand underneath it and it was just dripping down on me. It's literally like cutting off an arm and the, the blood keeps pumping and bleeding, you know, through the heart. And this is the blood of the tree. They call it bleeding. It's, except it's white. You can actually drink the water. From a birch tree, you can, you can drink the water. Or a maple tree, it's edible. It's full of sugars. It's actually very good for you. In fact, it, it's the, the, wa the blood is, or the water in the tree is even flowing in the wintertime. Not as much as in the spring. But a few years ago, I was pruning on some Japanese maples, one in particular. And it was, uh, I got out there in the morning, it was, I think it was in December, and the, it was 12 degrees above Fahrenheit, very cold. It had gotten down to about 8 or 9 that night, and by the time I got out, it was about 12 degrees. And I had my pruners, and I was pruning, just ornamentally pruning this tree, and it was even at that cold of a temperature, it was still, water was flowing. And icicles were forming on, within a few minutes, were forming on each of the cuts. And I had some that were an inch long, and I took pictures of them. I've never seen that before. Uh, they were, the water was freezing almost instantly, and I had icicles hanging down um, off these little pruning cuts I was making. Uh, very interesting. So water is flowing in these trees all the time, even when they don't have leaves, and they're they're in their deciduous state, their dormant state, there's still water flowing. That'd be like even when you're asleep at night, your blood is still flowing. 
even when animals are in hibernation, the blood is still flowing and circulating. Same as with a tree. So when, 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 when the life of Yeshua is flowing through us, we will produce fruit. We will bear leaves and we will produce fruit. And what are the spiritual fruit? Just like a tree produces physical fruit, uh, some trees produce more fruit than others, but all trees, unless they've been hybridized, produce some sort of a fruit uh, of some kind or the other, or a seed or something. But um, the, the fruit that we are supposed to bear is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we read about that. There's nine of those in Galatians 5, 22-23. Now let's explore the spiritual dynamics a little bit further of, what, of abiding in Yeshua. And what these dynamics are that allow us to be spiritually complete and to produce good fruit for Him. And that will bring results around us, life-changing and even world-changing revolt results. And this involves working, walking on the path of righteousness. Remember this passage here, Yeshua says, you know, he, if, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments. That's the path of righteousness. What are his commandments? It's the Torah. If you love me, keep my commandments. My Torah commandments, my, my, my instructions in righteousness. We see here one of the benefits in John 15 it says, we are made clean. This is verse 3 and 7. We are made clean. When we abide in Him, we are made clean. We are, we are, we are made pure, blameless, innocent, free of corrupt desires, sin, guilt, and from that which is false. The word made clean here is the Greek word catharsis, where we get the, where we get the word catharsis. It means to purge of, of undesirable or unwanted things in your life. You know, uh, it's, it's a purging. And that's what it means. He will cleanse us and, and, and purify us. And all, it will flush, his life will flush all that garbage out of us. That's why we have to stay plugged into Yeshua. So that all this garbage gets flushed out. You are what you eat. If you eat him, so to speak, eat his word and drink drink the waters from the waters of his, his spirit, it will cleanse us. It will clean our, our house. If a person says that they are a believer, but they are not abiding in his word, and they're walking in the flesh, it's because they're not spending time abiding in him. They're not letting that life flow. If you have problems in your life, the first thing you need to do is spend more time with him and let his word and let his spirit flow through you and clean you out. It's not like a spiritual enema. In verse 10 of John 15, it says, We must continue or abide in the love of Yeshua by keeping his commandments and the commandments of his Father. And like I said, we just talked about that. He says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And if, if, if you are going to be walking in sin, that's a violation of his Torah. 1 John 3, 4 it says that. And so that's one of the benefits, and that's one of the fruits, um, and one of the aspects of abiding in him. You keep his words. You do what he says to do. One of the other benefits, or the, the fruits of it, is John 15, 12 through 17. We must love one another. Abiding in him is loving one another. We love Him, but, but if we love Him, we're going to be loving others that are also abiding Him, and we're also going to be loving those that are maybe hard to love, because we're going to be living and acting as Yeshua acted, because His life is flowing through us. So I ask the question, how do we do this? Oh, I believe that Yeshua laid out how we walk in love, in the Sermon on the Mount, which is laid out in Matthew chapter seven, 5 through 7. And if you take a quick overview of the basic tenets or the basic principles that Yeshua is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, he clearly lays out 
how we walk in that love and how we can stay in His love and how we can abide in Him. And I'll just quickly review what he talks about here. Chapter uh, verse 5, chapter 5, uh, Matthew 5, 3 through 12 are the Beatitudes. Most of you know what these are or can at least name some of them. But bless, he says here, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So being poor in spirit, being humble and contrite is, is an aspect or is a fruit of abiding in Yeshua. Blessed are those who, who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see Elohim. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of Elohim. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, I mean, we could obviously go into each one of these and, and spend a long time talking about them, but this, this is going to, these are aspects of abiding in Yeshua. So, the first thing that Yeshua lays out in the Sermon on the Mount is, is, is a life of abiding in Yeshua is going to exemplify uh, the, the Beatitudes, or should be exemplified, uh, we should be, exemplify the Beatitudes. Also, Matthew 5, 17-19. Those who abide in Yeshua love is Torah. He says there, don't think that I come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. And, you know, it's that passage. Uh, do there. I could quote it, but hopefully you all know it. Uh, he says in Matthew, the next thing he talks about is loving our enemies. Matthew 5, 21, and he mentions it in another place. We will keep our word. We will be people who keep our word. Matthew 5, 33. We will be charitable givers. Matthew 5, uh, Matthew 6, chapter 1. We will pray without ceasing. We will know how to pray. And uh, there he gives this, the Lord's Prayer in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, to pray without ceasing. So we are people that are talking to Elohim and praying to Him and communicating, and that's part of abiding in Him. We will be people who flee materialism and greediness. Matthew 6, 19, you know, seek first the kingdom of Elohim and don't worry about all the physical things in your life. Yes, you have to take care of business, but you're not to be constantly focused on that. Just like we heard some testimonies earlier today, that Yehovah provides for all your needs. Yes, you need to get up and work. Yes, you need to take care of business, but you don't need to be stressed out about it. Yeshua says there, you know, why worry about all these things? You know, He knows every hair on your head, and He knows every sparrow that drops, and He adorns the lilies uh, like, you know, in the field, and there, there's, more, there's greater glory to that than there is to Solomon, all of His glory. You see the priorities of Elohim there are different than men's. Uh, he says that in Matthew chapter 6, 24, we will set our life's priorities spiritually straight by seeking first the kingdom of Elohim in all that we do. We will seek Elohim's help in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, and trust in Him in every way in all that we do, say and think. And finally, we must live by the golden rule. This is like the summation of it all. Matthew 7, 12. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's actually uh, from Hillel, the, the, the great Jewish sage of the day. And that was one of his sayings. Don't do to others that which you don't wish them to do to you, or do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that's really the summation of the Torah, the golden rule. So what are the results of abiding in Yeshua? Well, John 15, 3, we become clean, pure, free of sin, corruption, defilement, and guilt. I'm covering these things really fast. If you want to, go on my blog, and I've, I, I put all this here where you can read it. I posted it on my blog this, this, uh, t uh, a couple days ago. Um, if, uh, I may put a link to this on the YouTube video. What are one of the other uh, results of abiding in Yeshua? We will bear much spiritual fruit. John 15, verse 5. What are the fruits? Well, like we said before, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, mercy, temperance, meekness, kindness, patience, and all those things. Galatians 5, 
22 through 25. We will avoid being burned up in the lake of fire. That's a pretty good benefit of abiding in Yeshua. This is the fate of the wicked. Because it says in John 15, verse 6, that, that um, let me read that. Let me pick that up here real fast. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. And if you connect that with John or with Revelation 20, verse 15, it's talked about all the wicked whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. And we don't want that to happen to anybody, do we? I don't want to be there. And then it says, what one, of, one of the other benefits of abiding in Yeshua. Um, we can ask whatever we want of the Father, and He will give it to us. John 15, verse 7 and 16. That's a pretty good benefit. And then, glory will come to the Father as, as a result of our bearing much spiritual fruit. John 15, verse 8. That's a great benefit. When you bring glory to the Father in all that you say, do, and think, there is a great blessing in that. It brings great joy, fulfillment, and happiness to see the kingdom of Elohim expanded and know that you had something to do with it and to feel the Father's blessing and approval in your life. You will be filled with joy when you abide in Yeshua, John 15, 11. And we will become the friends of Yeshua, John 15, 14. I'm going to read that one. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you my friends. So here are the benefits. You get to be a friend of Yeshua. You know, how can you be a friend of Yeshua if your branch is cut off and laying over there in, in the pasture somewhere? You know, if you're a friend of Yeshua and you're abiding with Him, you're going to be connected like the arm is connected to the body or a branch is connected to the trunk of a tree. You're going to be in sync with Him and you're going to be lined up with Him and you're going to be abiding in Him and you're going to be friends. Now, in John 15, verse 5, it says, uh, Yeshua says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Um, I am going to um, put on some different attire here real quickly, and I'm going to go from being a, a Bible to, well, I'm still going to teach the Bible, but I'm going to go from, from um, being a, a pastor or whatever to being an arborist and put on my um, some of my clothing I wear when I go out and as an arborist I should put my hat on first as a certified arborist and there I put on my uniform usually I don't have sleeves sticking out of this shirt so I'll roll these up get them underneath there and this is my official uniform as a certified arborist and now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, as an arborist, an arborist is somebody who cares for trees. I didn't bring my chainsaw or my pruners in here or my spray rig while I spray, spray and fertilize trees or my ladders or like pole pruners or all the other gear I have, climbing gear. Uh, I would have had to bring my truck with all of its gear and, and equipment and all that stuff. And I just didn't feel like doing that today. And uh, you know, it'd be hard to get it all in here. But anyway, I want to talk about a little bit about tree morphology and tree, um, tree physiology, tree biology. Because when we begin to understand things a little bit from that perspective, I think, you know, the Elohim has set these things in motion and placed it all around us in his creation. That if, you know, he says that the ox knows its master and, and the donkey but my people don't know who I am. You know, heavens declare the glory of Elohim. You know, the trees clap their hands and praise Him. The rocks will shout out and declare the glory of Yeshua. All around us, the creation is doing things. The seasons and the sun going up and going down and the greater light and the lesser light of the, the greater light of the sun and the lesser light of the moon, all these things, you know, shining in the darkness are all pictures of spiritual things going on all around us. 
the days of creation and all of these things. And we in our modern culture have become so blinded to these things, we don't even understand that the creation is screaming and shouting and crying out and praising and worshiping Yehovah in all the cycles that go on. I mean, from the littlest thing, um, I didn't bring them, but you know, you know, there's every snowflake is different. You look, I mean, I look sometimes look at plants and things under a microscope and and. Uh, or, or a magnifying glass, and I see the details and the intricacy of all these things. And, or, or even like under the sea, I have shells that I have bought that, that were found thousands of feet under the sea, you know, seashells of mollusks and crustaceans and things like that. And you bring them up, and they're brightly colored with stripes and all kinds of colors. And nobody even goes down there until they had the ability to recently. And even down thousands of feet under the sea, miles down there, there's shells that are brightly colored. And you look clear out into the universe, and some of these pictures that they've brought back or they've taken with the space telescope, things that you couldn't see with the naked eye, and all these galactic and astronomical phenomena, and these pictures and, of, of the stars and, and black holes and gases and all these multicolored things that, that are just swirl and all these. I mean, I can't even describe it. You've seen the pictures taken by NASA, it's incredible. And that's all out there. I mean, everything glorifies Him. Everything. The, the stars or the planets, or they, each star, I guess, pulsates to a different um, 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 rhythm. And, and they, they make sounds, and you can hear them with instruments. And they're singing. They're crying aloud. It's a, and the whales in the ocean, are, you've heard the whales, and they make these sounds. And they're, they're, they're not audible to the human ear, but instruments can pick them up and they're communicating with each other. It, it's amazing, all this going on around us and we're like, well, I see, I need to go watch the football game and cartoons are on and yeah, I'm gonna, I need to get some ice cream and, you know, jump in the shower and sit on the pot and whatever else I do. And we're just oblivious. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those things, but, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm making a point. And we need to wake up. I mean, our whole society, we've become so modern, we're out of touch with, with reality. And so the, I want to talk about this tree here. Um, you know, let's examine tree biology to see what we can learn spiritually from how trees operate. First of all, I'm going to, I'm going to give a property of what a tree does, and then I want to talk a little bit about the spiritual applications. First of all, um, um, I want to talk about the concept of tropism, T-R-O-P-I-S-M. Tropism is a, is, is a, um, a biological thing that, that orientates itself in a particular direction. It's attracted in a certain direction or it goes in a certain direction. And trees, there's a lot of tropism going on in trees. Uh, for example, trees are phototropic. Phototropic means light sensitive or, or light oriented. Uh, the leaves on trees are such that they, they will orientate themselves toward the sun. You can see this in house plants. You put them in, in a windowsill and it'll all be, they'll all be facing, they're like radar dishes, they're all facing that way. And you turn the tree, the plant around, so the trees, are, the, the leaves are facing the, the, uh, the maybe the darkness. And, and within a day, they're all oriented the next, you know, toward the light. Or trees, well, the branches will grow. I mean, I see this all the time. They're growing, especially in a forest. A tree will find the light, and it'll, it'll snake its branch up and find some light up there between some trees where there's, there's, there's sunlight coming, and it will just... I've seen them grow clear over and around and up until finding that light. So trees are light-sensitive. They want that light. They need that light. And will, it's part of their, how they grow and how they produce food. Uh, and it's, they orientate themselves to catch the maximum energy from the sun's light, so that they can um, um, so that they can photosynthesize. We'll talk about that in a moment. Well, what are the spiritual parallels here? Well, we know from Malachi 4, verse 2, that Yeshua is the son of righteousness, S-U-N. He's the son of Elohim, but he's the son of righteousness. And he's likened there as the sun that shines out the light of, into the, the light of truth, the light of righteousness into a dark world. He's also called the light of the world. 
It shines in the spiritual darkness. Uh, John 1, 4 through 5, and John 8, 12. And his face shines like the sun in Revelation uh, 8, verse tw- uh, Revelation 1, verse 16. And so um, a righteous man needs to, like the leaves on a tree, needs to orientate his life toward the light of Yeshua, toward the light of the sun. So that's how we can learn, um, you know, to catch the spiritual light or the spiritual energy from Yeshua the Messiah. So we need to be phototropic toward Yeshua, the light of the world, as a a, a plant is phototropic toward the sun. Now, trees are geotropic. The word geo is is a Greek word. It means earth. And so they're orientated toward the earth, but not really. Um, They are orientated to grow away from the earth or the opposite direction of the earth. They grow upwards. You don't see trees growing. I mean, they put roots down in the ground, but you don't see a tree pointing its top going down. All trees, you go out and you look at a whole forest and they're all growing straight up. This is interesting because the sun is not always straight up. Sometimes it's over here, sometimes it's over here, sometimes it's over here, sometimes it's over here, sometimes it's over here. But they grow perpendicular to the earth and resist gravity and growing straight up. It's like they're pointing to Elohim. I mean, if you look at fir trees, or, or, or most trees are growing straight, and the only reason that they grow another way is because they're either looking for light or because something acted upon them to, to, to cause them to get bent in a certain direction. But naturally, if a tree, all the branches will, will grow straight up or, or in a way that they can get as much light as possible, and then they will go out and then up or, or whatever. Uh, and some droop. But they always have little branches going up in there. Anyway, but the trunk itself is growing straight up. Um, so they're growing away from the earth and toward the heaven. This is a very good, there's a very good spiritual lesson here. Um, the spirit of a righteous man naturally reaches away from his earth toward Elohim. Now, every man has a spirit, but not every spirit is activated. The, the spirit in man, whether human beings recognize it or not, has a yearning toward Elohim. That's our conscience. That's the little pilot light that all people have in them. And the Bible talks about that. And everybody wants to live forever. They, he's planted eternity in the hearts of all men. And that is supposed to lead us toward Elohim in heaven. The problem is it doesn't always, but that's why it's there. And even though man is composed of earthly elements, when we die, we rot and we turn back into dirt. Um, But our spirit yearns for him, especially when our spirit has been activated by the Holy Spirit. And so we, you know, our spirit man yearns for him, but our feet are planted firmly on the ground and we can't really get off the ground by our own strength. And, but we've got, and so it's like gravity is pulling us down, but our spirit is yearning to go up, and we're caught here in the middle. And it's our soul man, our soul man, we're spirit, body, and soul. Our soul man, which is our mind, our will, and emotions, is caught between these two places, between heaven and earth. And the natural carnal flesh wants to take over the soul, the mind, the will, and emotions, and do what the flesh wants. And the spirit wants to take over the soul and wants it to do what Elohim wants. And that's the battle zone we're in for the rest of our lives. And that's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7, where he says, you know, I don't do what I want to do. I, but my spirit, my flesh man wants to do this, but my spirit man wants to do that, and we're caught in this. So even though a tree, the gravity is pulling a tree down, and if you cut a tree down and it's separated from its roots, it'll fall down or branches fall off, but yet a tree wants to grow up, and we're like that too. And we've got to resist gravity. We've got to resist that downward pull and reach for the heavens like a tree does. So trees are geotropic. Trees are also hydrotropic. Hydro means water, and they, they orientate themselves toward water. I have seen roots on trees go clear over yonder, uh, seeking water. I mean, they'll go clear 50, 60, 80, I mean, small trees. Go, they'll send roots over. I've seen 
um, one time I was, there was a birch tree and there was a brick wall, you know, thick brick wall, it was about five feet tall, went under the ground and it was sitting on a, a concrete base uh, and, and the concrete base is probably about, um, about I don't know, two feet thick or so, or 18 inches, and it went down to subsoil. And this, the brick wall was probably 20, 20, 25 feet long and heavy. I don't know how many tons it weighed. And this birch tree, which is about this big around, was on the other side of the, tr the, the uh, wall. And the wall, the, the people called me, and they, you know, their wall was buckling. It literally was, this brick wall was buckling. It had been lifted by a root of this tree. And so I dug down there about, I don't know, a couple feet down, 18 inches, two feet down. And this tree had literally put a little hair root between the, the brick wall, which is resting on the cement, solid cement base, and it put a root, found some little opening, and put a root there, and lifted it up, and the root was now this big, and I could reach my hand completely underneath and come up on the other side after I'd excavated, and you know what? I said, I know there's a sprinkler head over there, and sure enough, I went in, on the other side of the brick wall, and there was a sprinkler head, um, and, and it was reaching for that. Um, I, got, I got a call last week from a client that they said, we, we have a, our sewer line is um, going into our house and it's nine feet down. They, they had a service come out and they, they sent a, a, um, a scope, a, a photograph up the sewer line and they found some hair roots in there from a joint. Now, trust me, roots around here don't usually go nine feet down. Usually about three feet is the most on the biggest tree, and I've ground out literally thousands and thousands of stumps over the last 25 or more years, about 25 years. But this root from a locust tree had gone down through um, the trench where they put in the sewer 30 years ago, and it had gone down through the gravel nine feet down to find a spot where there was a little leak in the sewer and it was getting fed some of that rich nutrients and it then worked its way into a joint between the two pipes and nine feet down, that's just unprecedented, but that's where roots will go, seeking water. And as the roots reach deeper into the earth for water, it makes the tree strong, both physically and also the roots, you know, you, you want when you plant a tree or a plant, even a house plant, or um, any kind of plant, you don't want to keep it watered all the time. You want to deprive it of water. Not for very long, but when you deprive your lawn of water or of plants, it, that forces the roots to go down deeper in search of moisture, or out in search of moisture. And that actually makes a healthier and a stronger plant. It makes a healthier and stronger tree, more able to resist a drought, a water issues, as well as wind and those kind of things. So that's, that's a good thing. But you don't want to deprive the water for too long, otherwise you will, um, the, you know, the tree will obviously die of lack of water. So this is what, a, what are the spiritual parallels? A righteous man, as we read in Psalm 1 verse 3, is planted by the river of water, which we know from that psalm, a righteous man meditates day and night on the Torah. The laws of God, the commandments, the statutes of God, specifically the Torah from Genesis to Revelation, but loosely speaking, the whole Bible is the word of Elohim. And he draws up water from the wells of salvation, which is Yeshua. He is the well of our salvation. And Isaiah talks about that in Isaiah 12, verse 3. And when a man seeks, seeks his, sinks his spiritual roots deeply into the word of Elohim, he will be like the wise man who's built his house on a solid rock, which is Yeshua, that's able to resist the storms of life. And Yeshua talks about that in Matthew 7, 24-27. So it's, we want to be seeking the water of the Word. We want to be seeking the nutrients so we can be a strong tree. We can bear fruit and we can resist um, the drought of life and bear fruit for Him because it takes a lot of water to produce fruit, especially uh, things like melons and cucumbers and that kind of thing, grapes, um, not so much some of the other trees, but, um, but especially those kind of trees that are full of a lot of water. Now, um, trees suck up nutrients. Trees will pull up water and nutrients from the soil through their roots 
and, and then these are translocated through the rest of the tree in several ways. You wonder how, how moisture can get up from the roots and, and, and all the way up to a, you know, a big tree. I mean, some of these big redwood trees, I've seen some down in, in, the, in the redwood forest that are like 22, 23 feet in diameter. I mean, the width of them is as wide as my truck, like from here to the wall over there. I mean, you, you have to see it to believe it. And some of them are, are hundreds of feet high. And they pull up massive amounts of water. And um, how does that happen? Well, it happens several ways. Um, through osmotic pressure. Uh, those of you that remember chemistry and biology, osmosis, uh, water goes from, um, uh, from uh, a place of, uh, help me out here, of you t chemistry, you, come on kids, pay attention, from a, a, a lower, a lower, um, a lower um, uh, um, what's that? No, that was last year. No, that was last year. Well, then in other words, um, a lower concentration of sugar to a higher, I mean, it's that kind of, or the vice versa, it's that kind of thing. Okay, and so, huh? Oh uh, yeah, osmosis. It, it goes, you know, where there's a solution. Huh? What? Oh, you don't know, okay. They forgot about it. They go from a lower uh, satur saturation of, of whatever the, whatever's in the water. Yeah, anyway. Um, See, that's one thing I never took. I had to learn all this on the backside. But anyway, so osmosis is one of the ways it does it. Another thing is atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure. So as the, as, as the air, as, as warm air rises, it pulls moisture up through the column of the tree and it evaporates or wicks out. And that's called transpiration. And that pulls also, atmospheric pressure pulls moisture up. I mean, when you see steam rising or fog, on a lake or whatever, that's, that's really what's going on there. The other thing is, is um, cellular attraction. Cellular attraction, and that's where um, it's kind of like magnets, or I don't know, I don't, I, I don't know how that works, but one cell attracts another and it just kind of pulls the water up. So there's several dynamics going on there. And then, um, and then this water comes up and it comes up through the leaves and it goes into the atmosphere. And the evaporation of the water from the tree, uh, the leaves of the tree, not only helps to keep the tree cool in the heat of the summer, so that moisture coming up cools the tree because the temperature in and around a tree is cooler than it is if you're out in the sun, but it helps to cool the surrounding area. So the tree doesn't have to fight worked or fight or struggle to make this process happen. It just happens. It's just sitting there and it happens. You know, if you're plugged into Yeshua and you are in Him, you are in Him, you don't have to fight for the river of life to flow. Rivers don't fight to flow. They don't flow uphill. They just flow. And if you are spending time abiding in Yeshua, you, His life will flow into you. If you do a graft, sometimes we have fruit trees that have different types of fruit on them, and you, you can graft a tree together. And what you do is you take a, a little, little twig or a little slip, and you make a slit in the, in the tree you want to graft into, and, you, and then you expose the tissue of the one into the other and slip it in there, and then you bind it up and, and tape it together. And then the, the, the nutrients from the tree will grow into this little slip and it'll, it'll give nutrients and eventually that'll become a branch. And it will bear um, different, uh, maybe a different kind of apple on that tree or something. And so um, that's, you know, th that's what, it just happens automatically. You don't have to make it happen. And when we're living in Yeshua, that's what happens to us. We must be like a tree planted by the waters, like it says of Yehovah's word in Psalm 1-3 whose roots suck up the life-giving substance of that word. As a result, we will bear much fruit because we're feeding on the word of Elohim. Um, and our leaf will not wither in, in hot seasons of life, and we will bear much fruit for him. So, by abiding in Yeshua, 
This just spontaneously happens. You don't have to work at it. I mean, yeah, you got to spend time seeking. You got to spend time, but abiding doesn't really mean hard work. It's it's just an automatic process once you get plugged in. And then the final thing we'd like to look at is the trees produce fruit. We've alluded this to this several times already. Well, as water is pulled up um, upward to the xylem. The xylem is, the, uh, is the, like the, the heartwood of a tree, and that's, those are the water-conducting tissues. It's just, it's just solid water, pretty much. And then nutrients are, flow up to the phloem. The phloem, if you just go inside the bark of a tree, it's, that, it's what we might call the cambium, and it's the innermost uh, layer of the bark that contains the tissues that carry the organic nutrients up to the rest of the tree, the sugars, the starches, and the... And the um, carbohydrates. It's like the blood system. We have water throughout our body, but our blood carries nutrients through, the, the re through our uh, body. And the, fl the phloem is like the nutrients of a, uh, or the vascular system of the tree. That's why if you, if you girdle a tree or, or you, 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 you take a saw or something and you cut all the way around, in, depending on each tree, it varies. It, it can be two to three rings in would be the phloem. Some it's a little bit more, some it's less. But let's say within an inch, half an inch, uh, depending on the size of the tree, you can literally kill the tree because it's not getting any food anymore. And, but anyway, so the, the, this, these organic nutrients flow up um, out of the, the roots with all of its minerals and then the sunlight captured in the leaf cells uh, contain chloroplasts, chloroplasts, that's the green pigment in the leaves. And then um, the, um, the light captures the blue and red parts of sunlight that drives a process called photosynthesis. And through a series of complex chemical reactions, uh, the, the, the use, the sun's energy is converted to, min, converts the minerals into simple sugars called glucose with starch and cellulose, and that's what feeds the tree. Our body has similar processes to go on, but it's different, but we basically feed on the same kind of thing. During these chemical reactions, and this is what's really cool, during these chemical reactions, water molecules are split apart. H2O is split apart, like, like, like hydrolysis, but without the electricity into hydrogen and oxygen, oxygen atoms, atoms, that's why it needs water. Uh, one of the reasons it needs water, uh, a tree needs water. And they're split into hydrogen and oxygen atoms. The hydrogen atoms combine, combine with carbon dioxide. So it pulls the carbon dioxide. When you exhale, you are exhaling carbon dioxide. And so the trees take that carbon dioxide, combine it with the uh, hydrogen, and they use that to produce food. And then the off product of that is O2, which we then breathe. So we need trees, we need plants, we need grass, we need moss, we need lichen, we need algae, we need anything that's green, we need seaweed. All of that stuff produces the oxygen that we breathe. It literally cleanse, cleanses the air. So the tree, I mean, this is incredible how Elohim Elohim set all this up. And like in Oregon, for example, the, the trees lose their leaves, but if you go out in the woods, that is the deciduous lose their leaves, but if you go out and look in the mountains, and even in the wintertime when all the leaves are off, the leaves, the trees are covered with lichen and moss. Sometimes it's hanging down. It's, the, the, all the branches and twigs are covered with lichen. Even the lichen in the wintertime is producing oxygen, it's photosynthating. So that process is going on out there in the forests even when the leaves are off. It's an amazing thing and the oceans probably produce more of it than anything. And they help to oxygenate not only the air but then the, but the ocean as well. So this is an amazing process. They take otherwise useless carbon dioxide and they change it into oxygen so we can breathe. What are the spiritual parallels here? Yehovah's Holy Spirit is like the sap in the tree that flows throughout the tree, energizing it, resulting in spiritual fruit production. 
All this occurs as we suck up the nutrient-filled water of Yehovah's Word, which feeds and energizes us spiritually. The Comforter, or the Helper, the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit of Yehovah, aids us in metabolizing or assimilating the word of Elohim. Remember it says, Yeshua said the Ruach would lead us into all truth. Remind us of things uh, that, uh, that he said and, and tell us things to come. So, when we abide in Yeshua, his life-giving energy and power flows through us and the results will be the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, obedience, kindness, meekness, all of those things. And through this life-giving process that is occurring in us, because we're abiding in and plugged into Yeshua, who's the source of our life, we make the world around us more livable. Just like trees produce oxygen. So, in conclusion, what is the bottom line here? Trees don't struggle to produce food and fruit. They simply abide through naturally occurring processes that Yehovah has put into motion and they just produce fruit. And similarly, if, we, if Yeshua abides in us and we abide in Him through the work of the Holy Spirit and we're feeding regularly every day on His Word and abiding in Him and talking to Him through prayer and meditating on Him and li trying to live our lives for him, through, for him and through Him and we're doing our best to imitate Him we, too, should be an outgrowth, just like a branch on a tree. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. We will be an outgrowth of that trunk of his life, and we will be reflecting in every way around us, to everybody around us, we will be reflecting his life, and we will be abiding in him. And I believe that Yeshua truly is the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden. Or, or that was a picture of him. And in him is life. And when we abide in him, we have life. And that physical, spiritual, emotional life, if we abide in him, eventually leads to eternal life. And we will not become a useless tree that does not produce fruit, that has to be cut down and thrown into the fire, which is eternal death and the lake of fire, which... I, none of us want to be a part of that. So abide in Him every day and let His life flow through you. And you can have eternal life, and as I like to say so often, and you will have your place and your inheritance in His eternal spiritual family in the new heavens and the new earth and in the new Jerusalem. Hallelujah and praise Jehovah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon his name. He is near, he is near, he is near. Yeshu Hashem Behir